Hello, Allegheny College Introductory Astronomy students, and welcome to another session of Introductory Astronomy. Today, we're going to be covering the material for Monday, April 13th, the beginning of time. We'll be talking about the Big Bang Theory, and we'll be covering the first couple sections from Chapter 17. I like to start with the astronomy picture of the day, and I chose one today from back in 2014. And what this shows is something that we're going to be talking about in more detail today. It shows the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation. The idea is going to be that when you look up into the sky in any direction, you see light, light that is left over from 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And this light is remarkably uniform in intensity and in its spectrum across the whole sky. You look in one direction, you see pretty much exactly the same thing as you look the other. There is a slight change, and that has to do mostly with the fact that the Earth, from our vantage point, is moving. Of course, the Earth is moving around the Sun, and the Sun's moving in the galaxy, and our galaxy is moving within the other galaxies of the local group, and our whole lo local group of galaxies is falling towards the Virgo cluster. And as we move through this swarm of background radiation, when we're moving in the direction, uh, th this direction, say, then the light coming from that direction is going to be blue shifted. And the light on the tail end that we're moving away from will be stretched out and a bit red shifted. You could imagine that you are, you know, embedded within a cloud of raindrops and as you start to fly in one direction you hit the raindrops more than in the direction from behind you it's a similar kind of thing here there's a swarm of photons and as you run in one direction the photons in that direction are blue shifted that's what's being shown on this side and the other direction is red shifted remember what this oval means this oval is representing the entire sky so here in the center is the direction towards the center of our galaxy and along this plane here, that line represents the plane of the Milky Way. But every point in the sky has been mapped to a different point within this oval. So this red portion over here is actually 180 degrees away from this purplish blue portion over here. And this is the direction into the universe in which we're traveling. And this is the direction we're traveling away from. We'll be talking more about what caused this cosmic microwave, microwave background radiation and what other information we can get from it today. So with that teaser, let's go ahead and get into the presentation. This is on the birth of the universe. And in the big picture here, we're going to present the evidence that there was a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And in, we, in some level of detail, will talk about what happens in each of the eras as this universe is evolving. So there will be a, a swarm of particles that exist that will then start to generate helium atoms through nucleosynthesis, or helium nuclei, I should say, through nucleosynthesis. And then when electrons fall down onto atoms, eventually, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, then this, what had previously been trapped radiation, will be released and cause that cosmic microwave background that we've been talking about. And then 13.8 uh, billion years after that Big Bang gets us up to where we are now. So in the first section, we're not going to yet say why we believe these things. We're going to state the idea for the model of the Big Bang. And then in the second section, we will talk more on the uh, evidence for the existence of the Big Bang. Now, you'll remember last time we were talking about playing the clock backwards and that being the first hint that there was a Big Bang. And so if these little ovals here are representing galaxies and we play the clock backwards, you see that the ovals all converge to a single point back at some time in the past. And maybe you're not convinced yet that they came from a single point, but certainly the universe was smaller in the past than it is now, so it would be more dense in the past than it is now, and that will also mean hotter. And if you do play this clock backwards, you find that it was roughly 15 or so billion years ago when the uh, universe started. Now, we can make refinements, as we'll be discussing, on that age, 
right? This was a simple estimate for the age of the universe at 15 billion years. But if we account for the fact that the universe's expansion rate changes with time and due to different influences, then we can get more accurate models that give you more accurate, therefore, ages. So when something expands, it gets cooler. So on the horizontal axis here, we have time since the Big Bang. And look at some of these numbers. This is on a logarithmic scale. So 10 to the minus 45 seconds, that's point. And then you have 44 zeros and a one second. So we're talking about phenomenally small amounts of time on the left edge of this axis. And then still 10 to the minus 35, 10 to the minus 25. These are all small amounts of time. But nevertheless, as you go to the right, you're getting forward in time. And this curve is representing the temperature of the universe, starting at phenomenally large temperatures, like, well, where the graph starts, 10 to the 31 Kelvin. Remember, the uh, center of the sun has a temperature that's merely 15 million Kelvin, a little more than 10 to the 7 Kelvin. So 10 to the 31 Kelvin is uh, phenomenal. And then as the universe expands, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler. That's how gases behave in general. If something expands, it does work on uh, it during the expansion and it loses its internal thermal energy. Running the clock backwards means that it's gonna be denser and hotter in the past. So when it's hot enough back in the past, you're gonna have these kind of interactions and reactions going on all the time. Remember that energy is matter and matter is, well, matter is a form of energy. A type of energy is matter. And so E equals MC squared is giving us the relation between the two of these. When something is very hot, you can have these reactions going both ways. You can have photons that collide and out of those massless particles of light, you get massive particles like an electron and an anti-electron, or it can go the other way where the anti-electron and the electron annihilate one another and then release radiation, gamma ray photons. And so these kinds of reactions are occurring continually in the early universe when it's very hot. Now there are four known forces in the universe, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. And as we'll mention, two of these four forces, the electromagnetic and the weak force, have been combined into a single theory. So if you like, you can think of it as there being now three fundamental forces in the universe. But here's a thought question for you. Um, I'll tell you the strong force is the force that binds together nuclei. We've mentioned this in the past. The weak force is at play whenever you have, for example, fusion. When a proton becomes um, a neutron and a positron and a neutrino, there the weak force is at play. It's mediated by W and Z boson particles. The electromagnetic force you, if you've ever rubbed a balloon against your hair and give it some static charge and put it up against a wall, you have some intuitive feel of what electromagnetic force is. It's forces from charged particles and moving charged particles on other charged particles. And gravitational force you certainly have some to intuition about, having lived on the surface of the Earth your whole life. You know that things like to accelerate down towards the mass beneath you you know that the Earth is orbiting around the Sun because of the gravitational force. We've talked about all of these forces now in this class. Here's a question. Which of these four forces keeps you from sinking to the center of the Earth? Pause it if you need to. Well, it's not the strong force. The strong force acts on very short distances, 10 to the minus 15 meters, and it's what holds together the protons and neutrons in a nucleus. If it weren't for the strong force, the positively charged protons would just push on one another and blow the nucleus apart, but the strong force overcomes that and keeps them together. But we're not talking about nuclei when we're talking about the force that is pushing up on you to prevent you from falling down in through the ground of the earth. 
Uh, we're also not talking about the weak force. There's no nuclear fusion going on here. And it's not gravity that's preventing you from sinking to the center of the Earth. It's gravity that's pulling you down towards the center of the Earth. But there's something that is preventing it. This is electromagnetic forces. Um, and so if you look at Bella here right now, she is being pulled downward towards the center of the Earth. But these few square inches between her and the couch are pushing up on her. And what is going on there is that the electrons in her are bumping up against the electrons from the couch, and that repulsion is pushing up on her. So although the entirety of the mass of the Earth is conspiring to pull her down from the gravity forces, these few square inches of electromagnetic forces are pushing up. So in a sense, the electromagnetic force is much stronger than the gravitational force. Right? You need the entirety of the Earth acting on her to give the same amount of force that a few square inches of interaction would give you due to electromagnetic forces. So we say that the electromagnetic force is stronger than gravity. And in fact, the way that I've ordered them here is from strongest. The strong force is the strongest force. It wins over electromagnetism to bind together those nuclei, for example. So the strongest is the strongest of the four, and gravity turns out to be the weakest. So this graph actually shows us the relative strengths of those forces. Let's start by looking at the far left edge of the graph. That talks about the state of the universe as it exists now, with the strong force being the strongest, and electromagnetic next, then weak, then gravity way down here in terms of their relative strengths. Now, as you go backwards in time, this is the rightward direction along this top axis. You see how the amount of time since the Big Bang is getting smaller and smaller as you go to the right? As you go backwards in time, you also get to higher and higher temperatures, as we discussed. And that's what the axis on the bottom is showing us. And uh, at some point, the electromagnetic and the weak forces at these higher temperatures unite into this electroweak force. Remember I mentioned that there is a single theory that we have that describes the electroweak force. And electromagnetism is one branch of that theory. The weak force is a separate branch of that theory, but they are two different sides of the same coin, so to speak. Two different facets of the same type of uh, force or theory, the electroweak force or theory. And so back uh, at this stage, those two forces, electromagnetic and weak, they would more act as one, a single electric force. And if you go back to earlier and earlier times still, you get to higher and higher temperatures. And um, yes, we have unified electromagnetic and weak forces to be electroweak. What about here unifying the strong force in the electroweak? Maybe. There are grand unification theories, that's what GUT stands for, that suggest that we will someday have a GUT force theory that combines the strong force and the weak force. People are working on it. There are hints that uh, it could work out. As of now, there is no self-consistent GUT theory just yet. And uh, nevertheless, it's not stopping people from looking. In fact, they're looking for also what's called a toe, a theory of everything. And that would be a single underlying theory that describes this gut force, which unifies the strong and the electroweak, with the gravitational force as described by general relativity. And if you had a theory of everything, you would just have a one theory and the four different fundamental forces would be different aspects of it. They would be different limiting cases or different facets of that one single underlying theory. And that is a grand goal of physicists. We haven't done it yet, but we hope that someday it may be possible to do. So let's go ahead and go through the stages of the Big Bang Theory and look at the history of the universe according to it. A couple things to note here. Thing number one is that, remember, when we say theory in science, a theory is just not someone's made-up idea. 
the term theory in science is a very specific term that means that it has passed many tests that have been put to it. And it is something that uh, is believed, is has been tested and has made predictions that have um, come to be true. And so if you talk about, for example, Newton's theory or Einstein's general theory, right? General relativity theory. These are things that have been tested and passed those tests. So although we haven't yet, we'll get to it soon, we haven't yet given you the evidence to believe in the Big Bang Theory. The um, idea is we will be showing you this evidence. That second point ties to this last statement. Right now, we're just going to step you through the various stages. They're called the eras, E-R-A, that the Big Bang Theory has as a part of. Um, and then we will finish by talking about the evidence today. So the Planck era is this very first era, and it lasts up to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And you may ask, where did this number 10 to the minus 43 seconds comes from, come from? It's phenomenally, phenomenally small, I know. But where it comes from is the combination of three very important fundamental con constants. Capital G, Newton's gravitational constant. This is a constant that comes up in gravity, both Newton's version of it and general relativity. H bar, the Planck constant, which comes up in quantum mechanics. And C, the speed of light, which comes up in general relativity as well as in electromagnetism. And there's only one way dimensionally to combine G and H bar and C to give you a time. And when you do that, what do you get? You get 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And so what this means, the way you can think about it is as following. You know, general relativity, our best theory of gravity, it describes on large scales how things respond to masses and energies, how space-time gets curved. And quantum mechanics, for example, um, that involves h-bar, and this describes how things behave on very small atomic and microscopic scales. And so, so far in the history of our understanding of physics, these two theories, quantum theory and general relativity, have been incompatible with one another. We don't yet have a theory of quantum gravity. We don't yet have a way of explaining what happens when you have masses at such small scales that quantum mechanics starts to become important. So when we say things like in general relativity, there's a singularity at the center of a black hole, we're making some assumptions that, about our theory. And that may be exactly where our theory starts to break down. General relativity may start to break down when you start to get to these small scales. So what does it mean to combine G and H bar and C? What you're doing is you're finding the time, if you combine it in such a way as to get the Planck time, before which the universe is small enough that simultaneously gravity and quantum effects are going to be mutually important and significant. And we don't yet have a theory that can describe that. And so we really can't say beyond speculation what's going on in that first 10 to the minus 43 seconds. If someday we get a theory of everything, we'll be able to say more, but at now um, we really can't say what happens in this smallest sliver of a fraction of a second. Next comes this gut era. The universe has expanded a little bit, and what you'll see is that as we work our way along this figure, we'll be going up. Up on this figure is going forward in time. And the width of this figure's central region here is representing the size of the universe. So back here early on, the universe is very small. It has a narrow width. And as time goes on, you see how it gets wider and wider and wider? That's representing the expansion of the universe. We think about the universe as being represented by a slice through this material. So we're not showing all three spatial dimensions, but any one of these little ovals that you could imagine as a slice through this central region 
is representing the universe at one moment in time. During this gut era, the gravitational force has been decoupled from the gut force, and um, we have this lasting up until the end of the gut force after 10 to the minus 38 seconds. Now, at the end of this gut era, you have an inflationary epoch. What happens is that the gut force decouples into the strong force and the electroweak force. And this is what's known as a phase transition. And I can give you sort of a qualitative comparison or an analogy to make to understand why when you get this phase transition, you pump energy into your universe, which causes this rapid expansion, this inflation. You know, in the winter time, sometimes when the temperatures are going to go down to uh, sub-zero temperatures at night, often what people do is they put uh, big buckets of water in their garages. And what's going on there is they want to take advantage of the fact that it takes a lot of energy. You have to suck a lot of energy out from water to freeze it. So you put this bucket of water in your garage and then the temperatures drop. Let's say they go to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it weren't for that bucket of water, it would just keep on going down 25, 20, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, getting colder and colder and colder. But what can happen is when it hits 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the air within the garage starts to pull energy out of the water to try to freeze the water. Water starts to freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it goes through that phase transition, a lot of energy gets released to the air in order to freeze it into water. And so as a result, because you're taking energy from the water, putting it into the air, the temperature in that room doesn't drop as much as it would have otherwise. The garage stays warmer. It holds at 32 degrees Fahrenheit for a while while the water freezes. And then it might continue to drop after that, but not as much as it would have otherwise. And so this is a qualitative analogy but the same kind of thing is going on here. The universe itself is going through a phase transition when this gut force decouples into the strong force and the electroweak force. And as it does, energy is pumped out into the universe, which causes, it, causes this rapid inflation. It's a type of anti-gravity that causes it to expand exponentially during this inflationary epoch. So we're still talking very shortly after the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 38 seconds, and we're now entering the electroweak era. Remember, this is when the strong force has been decoupled from the electroweak force. And so we uh, call this now the electroweak era. Um, during this phase, we have a soup of particles. You've got photons. You've got quarks. Quarks are what make up protons and neutrons. There's three quarks in each one of those nucleons. You have electrons. You have W and Z bosons, those particles that I mentioned that are short-lived during fusion processes. Well, here they're flying around in plenty. You have matter and antimatter, most likely weakly interacting massive particles. Those are known as WIMPs. All the particles that you can think of are available. These are very high temperatures at this point, and so it's possible to make a whole slew of different types of particles and keep them separated from one another. Now, the electroweak era is followed by the particle era, starting after about 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang. And during this particle era, the temperatures fall low enough that quarks are no longer isolated, but rather they come together in trios to make protons and neutrons, and the temperature is no longer high enough to break those trios apart. Now, there's still a lot of matter and antimatter in the universe at this point. In fact, for every billion protons of the antimatter type, antiprotons, there are a billion and one normal old matter protons. And indeed, at the end of this particle era, what happens is the antimatter 
annihilates with the matter. But because there was, for whatever quantum mechanical fluctuational reasons, <laughs> just a little bit more matter than antimatter, at the end of that particle era, all the antimatter annihilates and it leaves behind just the regular matter. What was before one part in a billion is now what you see for all the matter in the universe. So when we look out at the universe, with rare exception, we always see matter particles. You have to work hard to try to make antimatter and particle accelerators and so on. And so all the matter that we see that was left over after this annihilation event at the end of the particle era. Now, this starts a very important era in the history of the universe. We're now one one thousandth of a second after the Big Bang, and we begin the era of nucleosynthesis. Nucleo makes you think of nuclei synthesis you're building up, and indeed, that's what we're talking about here similar kind of fusion processes that we talked about before in the context of stars are now occurring to make protons into helium um, as the universe expands and cools. And so protons and neutrons form together to make deuterium and helium-3 and helium-4. And as we'll discuss, trace amounts of heavier elements than that, like lithium-7 and beryllium-9. But essentially, that will occur for five minutes as the universe expands. And at the end of five minutes, the universe is no longer dense enough for fusion, for the nucleosynthesis to occur. So when it spreads out too much, the protons aren't going to hit each other as often to make the heavier elements. So that five minute mark transitions us from the era of nucleosynthesis to the era of nuclei. It's not the era of atoms yet. An atom is when the electrons have fallen down onto and are orbiting around the nuclei. It's still very hot in our universe. And so we, we have our nuclei, like protons, nuclei of hydrogen, but also helium-3 and helium-4, especially nuclei. But those helium-4 nuclei, for example, they've got two protons, two neutrons, but the two electrons that you might often associate with a helium-4, they're not on the nucleus not as an atom, they're out flying around free. They're what are called free electrons. So the nuclei might be going one way, the electrons are going another. It's still too hot. If an electron happens to fall down onto a nucleus to make an atom, um, very shortly later it gets smacked by something else and the electron flies off. So you don't have those neutral atoms. Light still exists in plenty. When that matter annihilated with antimatter, you release lots of radiation. Now radiation only travels very short distances before it bounces off and scatters off those free electrons. And so we call those trapped photons. If somehow you and I could exist in some remarkably technological uh, pressure suits back then, and we were just standing a couple feet apart from one another, we wouldn't be able to see one another because the light from me, for example, it wouldn't be able to get to you uh, on a straight path. It would just bounce all the heck around. It'd be like trying to look through the densest of fogs. And so we still have an opaque universe. In fact, if you look at this central region of this graph here, you can see how everything's been opaque up until this point, right? It, up until the end of the era of nuclei, they've colored it in darkly. And that's a main thing that's going to change now at the end of this era of nuclei. This is a very important moment in the history of the universe's evolution, when we transition from the era of nuclei to the era of atoms. What's going to happen here is that the electrons are going to do what's called recombine. Recombine is a bad name because re and recombine makes you think like it's happened before. But this is not some combination that's happening again. This is the first time in the history of the universe that the electrons have fallen down onto the nuclei to make atoms. And when electrons are down tucked close to their nuclei, they no longer have the same potential to scatter photons that they did before. Photons can freely stream by, moving along straight paths, much more easily than they could before. And so now the universe becomes transparent. If you and I were a couple feet apart, 
uh, with our pressure suits and so forth, preventing us from being overwhelmed by the environment, photons could travel from you to me. In fact, they could travel much larger distances than that. So this moment when the electrons fall down onto the atoms, this is the moment of recombination, and that marks the transition from the era of nuclei to the era of atoms. We'll talk more detail about that in a, a few moments. After the era of atoms, we have within a few hundred million years the beginning of the era of galaxies. Protogalactic gas clouds collapse down to form clusters of galaxies and galaxies within them. And that brings us all the way up until the present day, 13.8 billion years after the birth of the universe. Now, I know there was a lot that we just went through, a lot to unpack. And uh, in a sense, we're, we're going to do it again right now. We're going to start back at the beginning, um, but we're going to focus on different things during this discussion. So first of all, note that over on the right now, we have a thermometer that shows us as we advance through time, which will be what happens as we move upward on this graph, the temperature is going to drop. Remember we said the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds is called the Planck era. We really have to speculate what's going on there. Um, we don't have a theory of everything that can describe the physics. We get into the gut era, and here you have elementary particles that exist in plenty. Look, the temperature has fallen down a little bit from its initial value. We go forward and uh, the strong force decouples uh, causing the inflation of the universe. We'll talk next class about reasons to believe that there was this inflationary epoch, the evidence for its existence. And then we enter the electroweak era. It's worth pointing out that in this electroweak era where we have many of these ele elementary particles, that we have a good feeling for what the physics is like back then. We have particle accelerators that move particles around on such great speeds that when they collide, the comparable temperatures, the corresponding temperatures to those collisions are like the temperatures that we have here in the early universe, right? At this moment in the electroweak era, we're looking at temperatures of 10 to the 19 Kelvin but we can get particles to collide together as fast as they collide together in that epoch or era of the universe. We have the electroweak theory, so we start to have confidence that we can describe the physics of how the universe would evolve during this early time. And remember, the electroweak era lasts only up until 10 to the minus 19 seconds, 10 to the minus 10 seconds rather, after the Big Bang. So that's a short little sliver of time. Um, and um, throughout most of that time, we have some understanding of the physics. Now, after the um, electroweak era, we have the particle era. That's when you have matter and antimatter still existing together with just a slight overabundance of matter. And then at one one thousandth of a second, the matter and antimatter annihilate, leaving behind that slight overabundance. Notice the temperatures here of the universe are down to about 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 Kelvin. As the universe expands, those temperatures are dropping, dropping, but they're still high enough that you shouldn't be surprised to see that we're going to have some nucleosynthesis going on next, right? Even at temperatures of 10 to the 9 Kelvin, that's much hotter than temperatures in the center of the sun. And so, Protons are moving fast enough toward one another that they can overcome their Coulomb repulsion and that the strong force can bind them together. Heavier nuclei can start to be made. And so that's what happens during the first, we now say about five minutes in the best model that we have for the Big Bang. At the end of those five minutes, what are you left with? Well, you can run your computer models through as we'll be talking about. And in those five minutes, uh, as you follow the nuclear reactions, you find that you convert what was initially, essentially by mass, almost 100% protons, hydrogen, into 25% helium and 75% hydrogen. There's going to be trace amounts of heavier things, but basically you convert protons into helium. 
from five minutes up until 380,000 years, the universe is still opaque. You still have free electrons. Notice the temperature is well above 3,000 Kelvin. 3,000 Kelvin is what the temperature is at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And that is a critical temperature because if you're above 3,000 Kelvin, then things are moving fast enough that electrons that happen to be on nuclei would uh, get knocked off and they would become free again. Below 3,000 Kelvin, the speeds are slow enough that collisions do not knock electrons off of atoms. And so that's why we're transitioning from the opaque universe to the transparent universe here. And at that transition, um, light will start to be allowed to freely stream. Now, at this moment in the universe's history, it's 3,000 Kelvin. You can look at the thermal radiation spectrum, the so-called black body spectrum for a 3,000 Kelvin object, and that's what this is representing here, the intensity versus wavelength. It peaks right around a micron. A micron is a micrometer or 10 to the minus 6 meters. And so it peaks at a relatively short wavelength associated with that 3,000 Kelvin radiation. Now, what happens next is very interesting, and I want you to pay attention to this graph down at the bottom that shows the spectrum. This is the spectrum of light, the light that's permeating through the universe. And let's point out now, because I just can't wait to tell you, that there'd be no reason to expect that this light would exist in the universe if there weren't a Big Bang. If there never had been a Big Bang, there would be no reason for this cosmic microwave background radiation to exist yet it exists. And so um, let's trace out what happens to it. As the universe expands, the light within it expands with it. This is a different kind of redshifting. We talked about Doppler redshifting. This is known as cosmological redshifting. The universe stretches out the light within it as the universe itself expands. And so as you watch this spectrum down at the bottom, Look at that peak there. It's being moved to progressively longer and longer wavelengths. And so once we get up to the current moment in the history of the universe, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, the peak has actually moved over by about a factor of 1,000. Instead of peaking at 10 to the minus 6 meters, it peaks at 10 to the minus 3 meters, 1 millimeter. And so this is the radiation that we would see in the sky today. It's also kind of neat that if you take thermal radiation, black body radiation, and you stretch it out in this way that I just described, every photon that makes up this spectrum is stretched out to a larger wavelength. That stretching gives you again a black body radiation spectrum, but for a cooler temperature. So once the universe has expanded by a factor of a thousand, the radiation is that of, a, of an object which is a thousand times lower in temperature. So although back at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the peak from Wien's Law would correspond to a 3,000 Kelvin object, a thousand times expansion later, it now corresponds to about 3 Kelvin, more precisely 2.7 Kelvin. All right, so this is the radiation that we view today. And um, the dots are measured values of this cosmic microwave background radiation. And the curve represents the black body spectrum that you would expect for an object that is 2.7 Kelvin. And so here is this evidence. We call it the cosmic microwave background radiation because at least at this point in the universe's evolution, the peak occurs at around one millimeter, which is in the microwave. Okay, for some physics fun, uh, sometimes people wonder about, okay, the universe is expanding. What kind of sizes are we talking about during these various evolutionary epochs? And to a good approximation, we can talk about the size of the universe with a very simple formula. If you take 130 billion light years and divide it by the current temperature in the universe, the temperature being the temperature of that cosmic microwave background radiation, then you take that temperature in Kelvin in the denominator and you get the 
size of the universe. So for example, right now the universe has a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin, 130 billion light years divided by 2.7 is 50 billion light years. That's about how far it is to the edge, if you will, of the observable universe. Remember, the universe is not infinitely large. And it also doesn't make sense to talk what's about what's outside the edge of the observable universe. A better analogy would be to think about a balloon, right, that's expanding and you live on the surface of the balloon. And the surface of the balloon has a finite size which is growing. But if you're a creature that's only aware of the surface of the balloon and you can't travel off that surface, you might mathematically be able to describe your balloon being curved in these higher dimensions, but you can't travel into those higher dimensions. Then there's an example of a case where you have a universe which is finite size, the surface area of your balloon, um, and still able to expand. Now, it's 50 billion light years. Some of you may say, where'd this number come from? I thought that the universe was 13.8 billion years. Does that mean the universe should have the horizon be 13.8 billion light years away? There's something here that's called a look back time. In other words, if I look out and I see light from 13.7, 13.8 billion years ago, I'd be looking back to the um, beginning of the universe. However, while that light was traveling through intergalactic space through for 13 and 13.8 uh, billion years, space itself would be continuing to expand. So by the time that light gets to us, the universe would have expanded more. And that's why it's 50 billion light years away. The stuff that you see where the light takes 13.8 billion years to get to you is actually by now 50 billion light years away. That's a way to think about this. So let's have some fun and look at the size of the universe during these various eras. So first of all, down here at the bottom, the current size of the universe is 50 billion light years. We just did that little calculation. As we go upward here, we're actually gonna to go to larger temperatures or earlier times. So this mark right here, for example, that marks um, that moment of recombination. 380,000 light years after, uh, 380,000 years rather, after the Big Bang, when the temperature in the universe is 3,000 Kelvin. And so there, at that moment, the universe is 40 million light years across, or in radius. These are rough numbers. Um, and so, if you go back further to the moment between the era of nucleosynthesis, and the era of nuclei, so when the helium stops being made, the size scale of the universe then is a hundred light years. Remember, the distance currently to the center of the galaxy is 28,000 light years. So a hundred light years is relatively small. It gets smaller though. At the beginning of the era of nucleosynthesis and the end of the particle era, the universe is 0.1 light years across. Remember, it's four light years to the Alpha Centauri system. At the beginning of the particle era, the universe is only six astronomical units in, in length scale. So you can barely fit the inner solar system within it. Of course, there's no solar system that exists then, but comparing it to structures that exist today. Now down at the bottom here, we have these last couple scales that we were talking about, the transition from the electroweak era to the particle era when the universe was 6 AU, we just mentioned. But now if we go all the way back to the beginning of the electroweak era, roughly where we can still trust the laws of physics that we have, the universe was a centimeter in size. So somewhere during the electroweak era, the whole universe was the size of, presumably you're in a room right now, the room that you're within, right? A centimeter, remember, there are 2.54 centimeters and an inch, and so a centimeter is this fraction of an inch and all of the universe is embedded within it. If you go back to the beginning of the gut era, then the universe is one one hundredth of a millimeter. Remember, if you've got a metric ruler, the, between the closest tick marks on that ruler, that's a millimeter, and we're talking about one one hundredth of that. Now, if you keep going back, you know, it's, it's hard not to ask questions like, 
what happened before the Big Bang. And of course, we don't know. And we don't know that that's even a meaningful question, right? It may be that that's unanswerable. But there are people out there, smart people like Ed Witten, for example, who works at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton. He's, he's spent a career working on mathematical physics, things like string theory. And if you want to read about, for fun, things like what happens before the Big Bang, you want to read about brain cosmology. But here brain is short for membrane, not B-R-A-I-N, but B-R-A-N-E. And these membranes are these higher dimensional membranes that can exist in what's called the bulk and they collide with one another. And at those points of collision, you get the Big Bang, the creation of the universe. This is perhaps tied to multiverse theories that you may have started to hear about, right? In the multiverse, there are many universes. Uni means one, right? Multi, many. And so the multiverse theory is not something that's currently testable. The idea, at least in certain types of multiverse theories, is that these multiverses are all causally independent from one another. So what happens in one universe cannot affect what happens in another. And what that means is there's no way to test that these other universes exist. Maybe, I mean, if, if, if we're talking science fiction, maybe someday in the future, your different multiverses collide and now they're no longer causally disconnected. But really this is a matter of not science, but uh, science fiction at this point. So, Fun things to read about if you do want to look about and think about what might happen before the Big Bang. The answer to today's reading quiz will be, the Big Bang is fun. The Big Bang is fun. And if you like, you can spell fun, P-H-U-N, because physics is fun. The Big Bang is fun. The last thing that we're going to do today is in the final couple minutes, start to give you some of the evidence for the Big Bang. Now, the first piece of evidence is something that we've been hinting at this whole 50 minutes. The cosmic microwave background radiation exists. We see it. Remember, the way that it exists is that light is trapped before 380,000 years after the Big Bang. These little yellow squigglies are representing photons and notice that they are bouncing off those blue dots to represent the free electrons. And so they don't go very far before they bounce. As you move to the right on this diagram, you're going forward in time. That means the universe is getting cooler and cooler. And at this moment, when the universe passes through 3000 Kelvin, that's the moment of recombination where it transitions to those photons just traveling freely. So no longer are they um, trapped but rather the universe is now transparent. And so if we play this little interactive figure over on the right, we'll be able to see that perhaps more clearly as it plays out. The thermometer shows us the temperature. At the beginning here, it's 6,000 6, Kelvin in our universe. These little yellow squigglies are the photons, the blue dots are the electrons, and then we have protons and helium nuclei. Once we press play, notice the temperature in the universe is going to start to drop. The photons are bouncing off of all those free electrons. And then notice what happens when the temperature goes through 3000, the electrons are now bound to the nuclei to make neutral atoms. And that allows these photons to freely stream. And so that 3000 Kelvin corresponds to uh, radiation that peaks that's the boundary between the visible and the near infrared. Now, that cosmic microwave background radiation has been detected by, at, uh, originally, Penzias and Wilson in 1965. You see the horn antenna in the background there that they used to detect that radiation. And the um, story of Penzias and Wilson and how they found that radiation and what it meant for astronomy, we will save to till next time when we continue on in chapter 17 on the Big Bang and on the history of the universe. I hope that you stay safe and take care.
Bye-bye.